So as the title implies, this is a seed project working towards ensemble modeling of uh, distributed uh, liquefaction impact. So this is a currently ongoing project, and so I'm going to show you uh, sort of a mix of results, but then also some planned products. So I'll first uh, try to frame this uh, more, more so in the vision of what I ultimately am hoping to do here. And then second, I'll talk a bit about the specific objectives or benefits in the near term of the seed project. So regarding the former, this, this larger motivation, uh, you're probably already familiar with ensemble models, even if you haven't thought about it, because we use ensemble modeling within seismic hazard analyses. So within a logic tree, we use multiple GMPEs, and we weight them based on their past performance. And it kind of begs the question of, why don't we do this with liquefaction? Uh, after all, we have numerous competing models across several tiers of complexity. And generally, we just pick one. And when we do that, we often are uh, essentially neglecting data that might be important to us, data that underlies the models that we haven't chosen. And it also leads to uh, potentially large swings in our predictions based on the adoption of a single model. So as I see it, looking at uh, the ensemble of methods for predicting liquefaction, we basically have three tiers. And if we start in the middle, we have methods that are based on in situ geotechnical tests. And we take this data and we use it in conjunction with our so-called uh, simplified methods. So within a triggering model, then using the results of triggering in sequence with a manifestation model. And if we consider the different types of data, the different triggering models, the different manifestation models, you can easily think of 30 or 40 variations of model. Now we might want to go up a tier, uh, more complexity, more expense, and do some physical modeling or some numerical modeling. Or we might go in the other direction down to tier one and uh, use something based on geologic data. For example, what's used in the Hazus uh, system. Now in terms of distributed infrastructure or transportation systems, we obviously have to do regional scale uh, predictions. And we've seen in the last couple of presentations that we might be kind of on the fringe of doing that in real time with numerical modeling, uh, at least for very select inventories of assets. Uh, we're not there yet with, with liquefaction. So at the moment, we're sort of relying on these two camps of approaches. Uh, either we use our tier two uh, geotechnical tests. So for example, here's a liquefaction prediction uh, from Christchurch, New Zealand. This is regional scale. Uh, this uses uh, CPT data, that's point data, and specifically it's derived from over 20,000 of those tests. And so this model, it costs somewhere on the order of $100 million to develop. So outside of some pretty unique situations, this is just not economically feasible. Uh, the other camp is uh, the Tier 1 geology maps, and so this is what Hazus uses. And the method that's in Hazus actually dates to the 1980s. It hasn't changed uh, since then. It has the benefit of being continuous data, but we're only getting a very rough statistical expectation across the geologic unit. And if you actually try to follow what the model is doing, uh, you quickly realize that it's sort of someone doing the best that they could with almost no useful information. So it's just, it's not very useful at the site-specific scale. So the sort of summary is it's, it's really challenging to predict at regional scale uh, in, in a manner that's both accurate and economical. So meanwhile, uh, we have so-called seminal, uh, well, they are very seminal, and they're called geospatial models. Uh, so Lurie Bayes and, and colleagues uh, have developed these. Maybe you've seen them. Uh, they essentially rely on geospatial parameters that are free and, and readily available. And these are parameters like VS30 derived from the ground slope or the compound topographic index or distance to rivers. And we could name 30 more of these parameters. And when used in combination, they can be used to uh, infer 
traits of the subsurface without in situ testing. So these models take on a couple different forms. There's regional models, global models. Uh, here's one example. So this is called the geospatial liquefaction index, and it simply uses distance to rivers or coastline, the water table depth, uh, climate metrics, the S30, and some intensity measure. So it's very simple. It, it seems almost too simple to work, but, but let's take a look. So it's, it's quite intriguing, but uh, there's no testing. Uh, no testing against geotechnical models, and uh, there's no prediction of severity or impacts. It's just kind of this index that should correspond to the likelihood of liquefaction. So considering these geospatial models and, and kind of thinking about the long-term goal of ensemble modeling, it's really critical that we have a first-tier continuous model that will serve as the background or the prior prediction that could then be updated with geotechnical data uh, maybe even with numerical analyses. In the short term, think about what you could do with a better hazus like model, meaning uh, free real-time prediction of liquefaction impacts. So we could use this in, uh, to study scenario events, kind of like we use HAZIS now, in emergency response or reconnaissance, so we might immediately know uh, where we have infrastructure that may have been damaged by liquefaction. Uh, and, we, and we might use it in areas without geotechnical testing, so developing countries, uh, areas with induced seismicity where we don't have geotechnical data or can't develop it faster than the hydrocarbon development. So moving on to the specific objectives of the SEED project, uh, there are five of them. I'll just briefly mention what they are and then uh, say a few more things uh, in more detail. So the first is to test the geospatial models against geotechnical models. And so we're doing that using 15,000 CPT-based case histories uh, compiled from 26 earthquakes, nine countries, but they're mostly from Christchurch, and there's sort of a theme to that. Uh, secondly, we'll test, we'll use the test results to improve the geospatial models. So these are actually developed without any insights from the subsurface. So, We'll look at these liquefaction case histories, and then we've also compiled 2,000 CPTs from across the US. And the idea is, let's not just blindly make predictions from above, let's inform those predictions with data from below. With those improved models, we'll uh, go on to predict the severity of ground deformation. So in the absence of asset-specific data, the severity of ground deformation is a very practical proxy of where you might have infrastructure damage. In some cases, we do have infrastructure uh, uh, damage and loss from case studies. So we'll also develop some asset-specific fragility and loss functions. So just as one example, we have insurance assessments from 80,000 uh, buildings in Christchurch. And then lastly, will implement these functions within the performance-based framework. So nothing really new here, just convolving the functions with the seismic hazard curve to uh, predict annualized effects or uh, the probability of, of something happening during a, a planning period of interest. So I'm just going to show you a couple uh, results to sort of pique your interest and then also point out what the planned products are. So as for this test between geospatial and geotechnical models, these are the case studies that we've spent quite a lot of uh, time uh, compiling, um, along with all of the infrastructure uh, damage and loss data. And you'll note that while we have 15,000 case studies, they're mostly uh, from Christchurch, uh, the three events highlighted in red. And so it's important that we kind of look at these two data sets separately. And you know, those of us, uh, those of you who are not geotechs, you, you might get tired of hearing about Christchurch, but I, I think it's just worth reiterating that prior to 2010, every earthquake combined had produced 280 liquefaction case studies. Christchurch comes along and now we're talking about tens of thousands, so um, you have to excuse the geotechs sort of being excited by, by Christchurch. So, I want to show you some of the test results, uh, looking here just at the Christchurch data. Now, time is, time is really short, and very few of you are geotechs. So 
I'm just going to show you the results without the details, just to pique your interest here. So what we're looking at here, these are tier two geotechnical models, and we're looking at triggering models used in series with manifestation models, and they're plotted uh, in the order by which they were proposed, and so we can kind of look at how things are changing over time. And on the y-axis is a method of a, a metric of prediction efficiency. This is the area under the rock curve, which is a pretty popular metric uh, for, for um, quantifying classifier systems. And so again, these are our geotechnical models, relatively sophisticated, uh, moderately expensive. And if we draw a line through them, we can maybe get some sense of how things are changing or improving over time. And it doesn't really seem like we're, we're going anywhere too quickly. Uh, and, and so to me, that suggests that maybe we need something a bit more disruptive if we're going to see dramatic improvement. So Professor Bray talked this morning about uh, taking a more disruptive approach to, uh, to studying the interbedded layers. Um, seemingly something like that will be needed to get a lot of improvement. Um, of course, the efficiency is pretty good. It's up towards 90%, and so we might say, well, you know, maybe that's just the limit of, of tier two before you go to numerical modeling. But if we add in the geospatial model performance, and it plots amongst the geotechnical models, and so this is, this is really quite surprising. It's kind of head-scratching. You know, how, can, how can something free perform so well? And it's almost stress-inducing for, for the geotechnical modelers. Um, it's important, though, that we look at the global data set of case histories. And so now, same type, same type of data, but we're just looking at 280 cases distributed around the world. And again, these are the geotechnical models. Um, the efficiency is around 75%. And so we're, we're right in between random guessing and, and having a perfect model. And again, the, the performance is pretty flat. That's, it doesn't really mean that much, though, because uh, the case histories that we're testing these models with were also used to develop the models. So we, we wouldn't necessarily expect them to be very different. Now, when we add in the geospatial model performance, it's quite a bit lower, so 58%. So it's an improvement over random guessing. But now we have quite a noticeable separation with the geotechnical data, and that's really what you'd probably expect going into this. So it, it leads to the kind of obvious uh, question of why is it that the geospatial models can be so good, but on a global scale, they're not, uh, they're not portable. So this has kind of put us on the, the road to try to improve the models. And I'll just give you one quick example here of how they can be improved. So this is a site in coastal California. It's on flat ground, it's close to the coast and to rivers, it gets some rain, and the geospatial model says this should be a highly susceptible site. But when we look at the CPT data from this site, uh, it tells us that this is mostly clay in the subsurface, and so we wouldn't really expect there to be much in the way of a surface uh, manifestation. So the challenge here is when you look at uh, these valleys from above, they kind of all look the same. So how do you know if it's clay or sand or gravel? And this has taken us back to the geology maps and data that the geospatial models uh, ignore. And that's showing that you can get quite a, a nice improvement. So taking these improved models, I'm just quickly showing you what we're uh, developing now. So we're moving on to, to uh, using the, the geospatial models to predict ground settlement and to predict the severity of ejecta by way of fragility functions. Uh, again, those are uh, sort of a practical proxy of damage if you don't have asset-specific uh, performance information. We're then, uh, when we do have asset-specific data, we're developing <laughs> fragility functions for things like roads and pavements and pipelines and specific types of foundations. We also have a little bit of insurance data that's specific to buildings on particular uh, types of foundations so we can develop loss functions as well. And then lastly is just implementing these functions in the performance-based framework. Uh, nothing, nothing new or different here, just convolving the functions with the seismic hazard and we can compute annualized effects or annualized uh, uh, loss, for example. 
So just to summarize uh, with a couple of bullet points, the geospatial models, I think, are really, uh, their, their performance is really quite surprising and provocative and really surprising. I can't emphasize that enough. Um, and so accordingly, we're, we're essentially testing, improving, and extending these models to also predict infrastructure damage and loss. And so the very near-term benefit will be first-order modeling of impacts uh, with real-time capability and performance-based compatibility. And in the long term, uh, the vision is to, to include these models uh, within an ensemble modeling approach. Uh, so with that, I'll take any questions. Thank you very much. I just have one short question. So the table you showed that, that dominance of uh, Christchurch data, that I noticed, for example, Kojeli is only 16. It, is that the data available to you, or that's, that's the, the whole data? I mean, just Christchurch had many of these data points. I think that's what's accessible, or that's everything? I think it's fair to say both. Okay. And so, so why is Christchurch so different? I, I think it has a lot to do with the, uh, the institution of the government insurance and the fact that they were responsible for insuring the land. Um, so I would have guessed maybe Kojeli so also would have a lot. All yeah. the houses in, uh, in New Zealand are uh, somewhat insured by the government. And that explains this region because there was significant damage in the foundations. And just to give a little context, so one one CPT, I mean the price of course varies, but you're talking about maybe several thousand dollars. And so if you're going to do twenty thousand of these, that's quite a big investment. It requires a, a fairly unique government funding situation. Any other questions? Yeah, is there so? It sounds like both the regional geospatial kind of approach and the traditional geotechnical approach of drilling and doing the simplified method both have value. Um, and I think this is what you're getting at with this ensemble method. But is there a way to combine those in one type of analysis when you're, u where you're using this regional geospatial data to interpolate between available subsurface investigations? That's sort of the gist of where this is going. And so that it could take on a few different forms, but for example, if you were, if you were using a, a Bayesian averaging approach, the sort of first tier model would become your prior prediction and it would be updated with the data that, that is available if you, if you have it. And, and so yes, it would have to include the spatial uncertainty through spatial correlation as well. But, but yeah, there, there definitely is uh, a method with precedent for merging multiple models. Greg, was that fragility function for eject a conceptual thing, or do you actually have data behind that? This particular one is conceptual. Uh, so the one I've actually shown was developed for geotechnical data, the, the label has been changed. I think this is um, actually LPI or something. So it's conceptual, but the, the, data, the data is there and it's just being developed at the moment.